do this and and I got that. Um, so uh, let me begin with uh, these disclosures uh, in terms of interests and funding um, <clears throat> and um, then move into the presentations. I want to start just by talking about uh, some uh, global uh, TB and TB HIV epidemiology. You can see here from the latest report from the WHO that uh, uh, a couple of interesting things. The overall uh, incidence of tuberculosis globally has changed very little and is on a uh, Im almost imperceptible uh, downward uh, slant uh, uh, over the last uh, 20 years. Uh, and very importantly, in uh, 2020, uh, notification of cases uh, took a, a, a sharp decline, which I'll show you more uh, in, in a moment. HIV positive TB cases uh, have been declining steadily, but in 2020, things uh, leveled uh, off. And then bottom, uh, in the bottom, we see uh, mortality. And these are on logs. This is on the log scale on the left. Um, so um, TB, uh, important global cause of mortality and important cause of mortality in people with HIV. In 2020, as I mentioned, because of the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, there was a marked decline in TB case notifications, marked decline in TB diagnosis. And you can see on the right-hand side of this slide that uh, India accounted for a large proportion of the undiagnosed cases uh, because uh, of uh, disruptions in healthcare, disruptions in diagnostic services. Uh, uh, subsequently, it looks like there's been a catching up and those cases that were missed are, are being uh, detected. Um, but uh, TB took a, a big hit with uh, uh, a loss of diagnoses and early treatment uh, in uh, 2020 because of the pandemic. So TB was uh, the leading infectious cause of death globally until uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, came along um, and, and, and eclipsed it. And uh, presumably and hopefully uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 will not remain the leading infectious cause of death, which means that TB will once again be the leading infectious cause of death. And it's uh, an important cause of death with it causing over a third of deaths in people with uh, HIV. Uh, and even if you remove in this in this graph on the on the left, the shaded gray uh, um, uh, area is uh, deaths from people with uh, HIV due to TB. Uh, but if you remove them from the TB um, uh, deaths, you still see that uh, uh, TB far uh, outweighs HIV now in terms of global mortality. So what I'm going to do for the rest of uh, the 20 or so minutes that I have is just um, talk a, about a few selected things in what's new in TBHIV epidemiology, treatment, uh, and prevention. Um, so in terms of what's new in TBHIV epidemiology, uh, the answer is not a lot. And so I wanted to just focus on uh, one study that's, uh, I think, uh, important and interesting. And this is a study that was uh, instigated or, or inspired, I should say, by Eileen's uh, spectacular Croy plenary in 2020 on sex differences in HIV. And my daughter, uh, Lilia, who was a PhD student here at the time, uh, was interested in whether this might extend to uh, tuberculosis in people with HIV. Um, and so with colleagues in Brazil uh, did this analysis, which was presented at Croy uh, a month ago. Uh, and uh, what uh, she did is she looked at uh, TB, HIV, uh, she looked at HIV cases rather in um, Rio de Janeiro over a uh, six year period. Uh, and there were about 55,000 uh, cases of HIV or people with HIV uh, in, in Rio during that time. And um, uh, about 36,000 uh, men and uh, 19,000 women. There were 30,000 incident uh, cases during that period of time. And there were a lot of similarities between men and women uh, in this uh, large epidemiologic surveillance cohort. Uh, they had similar ages, they had similar CD4 counts, uh, similar viral loads. Uh, 
at uh, baseline, uh, but women had more socioeconomic uh, and sociodemographic risk factors for TB than men, uh, though TB infection uh, wasn't uh, measured. And uh, what was seen was that overall, the um, uh, incidence of uh, TB was about just under 1% per year, but it was higher in men than in uh, women, as is seen in um, uh, the general population without uh, 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 HIV. It was uh, higher in men on ART and, uh, than in women and higher in men uh, who initiated uh, ART than in women, though that was uh, attenuated. So if you look at uh, this boxed area, you can see the ratio of males to females overall uh, is significantly higher, uh, particularly for those not on ART, but um, uh, also for those uh, who started ART. And if you look at those just with incidence uh, TB, incident TB, um, again, uh, uh, more men than women. And uh, for those uh, not on ART, uh, uh, more men than women and uh, uh, for those starting uh, ART. And then if you stratify by CD4 count, uh, similar things are seen. So this follows in um, concert with um, experience in other infections, HIV, uh, SARS-CoV-2 and others that there are biological differences between uh, men and women, which uh, in the case of TB and HIV appear to protect uh, women. So that's a very interesting area that I know Eileen and uh, uh, Bill Bashai and Sarah Klein are, are looking into uh, in, in a number of studies. So moving on to treatment, um, <clears throat> the uh, standard treatment for TB and for TB HIV has been uh, unchanged in the last 40 years. Uh, it's a four drug regimen of, uh, of isoniazid, rifampin, paracinamide, and ethambutol given for six months. And there are different strategies for giving it, but uh, the number one regimen here recommended for all patients, but especially for people with HIV is daily treatment uh, for six months with this uh, four drug uh, uh, regimen. Um, and for the first time in a long time, I'm able to have a slide that says what's new, because it turns out there's a lot that's new just in the last uh, year or so. So there's now a four month regimen for adults and adolescents with uh, drug susceptible TB, a four month regimen for children, and there's a six month regimen for multi drug resistant and extensively drug resistant TB. And before I get into that, I just want to uh, mentioned that all of the progress in treating and preventing TB in the last um, 20 to 30 years is because of the work of Jacques Rosse and Eric Nornberger here at Hopkins uh, in the TB Center. And the, the uh, mouse model developed by Jacques Rosse some uh, 40 years ago has just been indispensable in identifying new regimens which can then be taken into humans and have completely transformed uh, TB uh, therapeutics. And this is just an example of what I'm going to talk about next from the lab uh, where uh, <clears throat> when um, rifapentine, a, um, a more potent rifamycin than rifampin with a longer half-life was substituted for rifampin in the mouse model, you see there's a, uh, um, a much better um, uh, clinical response in, in, in mice measured by uh, colony forming units in the lung. And when you add moxifloxacin to that, uh, it's an even more potent uh, regimen. And there was 20 years worth of work that went into uh, uh, getting to where we uh, currently are. Um, but I wanted to uh, emphasize just how important uh, that mouse work uh, was in uh, getting us to a four month regimen. So this is the uh, four-month regimen. This was uh, ACTG um, um, 5349, uh, TBTC, TB Trials Consortium Study 31. It was a study that looked at two four-month regimens based on the mouse model um, and, and human uh, phase two data uh, of substituting either rifapentine for rifampin or rifapentine and adding moxifloxacin instead of ethambutol, and instead of treating for six months, uh, treating for four months with a primary endpoint of um, uh, status, you know, treatment success uh, one year after enrollment. 
And so this is uh, individuals with um, uh, pulmonary TB 12 years and older, uh, treated seven days a week with the regimen, the rifapentine uh, dosage was 1200 milligrams, moxifloxacin uh, 400, and it was a non-inferiority uh, trial. It's done in 13 countries on four continents and 2,500 uh, individuals. Um, uh, uh, 8% of whom were HIV positive and 73% um, uh, of whom had cavitary tuberculosis. So just to get to the, uh, the main results uh, for the rifapentine moxifloxacin regimen uh, compared to control and this microbiologically eligible would be your modified intention to treat. There was a 1% difference but clearly met the non-inferiority uh, margin that had been set for the study. And for the accessible population, which excludes people who didn't have a follow-up visit at 12 months, it was a 2% difference. The rifapentine alone substitution was not successful, did not prove to be uh, non-inferior. Um, so um, this, this regimen of rifapentine and moxifloxacin in four months uh, was successful. Um, when we look at um, uh, a number of subgroups, uh, what you can see is that uh, um, for all of these different subgroups, this uh, rifapentine moxifloxacin regimen performed quite robustly. So this is a, a really, really good uh, regimen. For the HIV uh, positive participants, the uh, rifapentine moxifloxacin regimen was actually better, not significantly better, but it was better. And you can see the um, uh, <clears throat> unsuccessful outcomes were 22% for the standard of care uh, versus 14.5% for the uh, rifapentine moxi uh, regimen. Um, but the rifapentine alone was considerably worse. Um, than the standard of care. Um, so uh, just a couple of weeks ago, the CDC issued some updates to the US guidelines for treating TB and um, uh, uh, recommended this four month regimen for adults and adolescents over 12, over 40 kilograms who don't have um, known or suspected resistance to uh, any of the drugs uh, in the regimen. The WHO recommended this regimen last year, um, uh, shortly uh, after publication of the, um, of the study in the New England Journal. So what about treating people with HIV who have TB? And overall, I think everyone knows the recommendation is to start ART um, uh, within eight weeks and within two weeks for people with CD4 counts under 50. So what are the options? Well, the options first are uh, using uh, an efavirenz-based uh, regimen, uh, which is a uh, preferred regimen globally. Um, and um, you can use it with either rifampin or rifapentine. You can also use an efavirenz-based regimen and substitute rifabutin. Uh, you have to increase the rifabutin dose, but there's absolutely no reason to do that. Um, Rifabutin has more toxicity, there's less experience with it, um, and there's no reason not to use rifampin or uh, rifapentine. So even though it's in the guidelines, it's totally unnecessary. Um, oops, sorry. But uh, since integrase inhibitors and dolutegravir in particular are uh, dominating uh, the, the world market right now, um, integrase uh, inhibitor-based uh, ART is also uh, a preferred uh, regimen. And uh, rifampin uh, using um, uh, dolutegravir 50 milligrams twice uh, daily um, is a recommended regimen, but rifampin can also be used with raltegravir and rifabutin can also be used with raltegravir, not recommended with uh, Bictarvi. And then finally, boosted PIs can be used in those individuals who need to be on a boosted PI. Um, so this is a case where uh, rifabutin is um, uh, often used uh, with uh, boosted lopinavir, uh, but uh, double-dosed uh, lopinavir with rifampin has also been shown to be uh, effective and um, in one ACTG study safer than uh, rifabutin. Um, Kelly Dooley led the uh, INSPIRING trial, which looked at standard TB 
treatment in people with HIV and compared, uh, actually it didn't compare, it was a non-comparative trial, but you can see the comparison in this um, graph, uh, giving dolutegravir uh, 50 milligrams twice daily to overcome the interaction with um, uh, rif uh, rifampin versus efavirenz. And you can see that uh, uh, the, the regimen in terms of viral suppression uh, performed uh, very well and the clinical outcomes for TB were equal in both arms. So this is the basis for recommending the 50 milligram twice daily uh, dosage for people being treated for TB with uh, a rifampin or, or rifapentine-based um, uh, regimen. No data yet on rifapentine. Um, <clears throat> in the study of high-dose rifapentine that I just talked about, study 31, we did include people uh, uh, treated with efavirenz, either people who were on efavirenz at the diagnosis of TB or who started a favorins four weeks after, uh, sorry, eight weeks after uh, beginning their TB therapy. And you can see that uh, there was absolutely no effect of this high-dose uh, rifapentine on a favorins uh, exposures. And so this is uh, a recommended uh, regimen. For using TAF-FTC um, with uh, rifampin, uh, this PK study um, uh, showed that uh, rifampin had no effect on the FTC. There was a marked decline in the plasma levels of, uh, of TAF with, uh, with rifampin and the AUC was reduced uh, both by about half. But the intercellular concentrations of uh, uh, tenofovir diphosphate uh, uh, were, were lowered only a third. Uh, and those concentrations were still fourfold higher than the concentration seen in standard TDF without rifampin. And so uh, the FDA has backed off a bit and the new guidelines from uh, uh, the US Public Health Service say that use of, uh, of uh, rifamycin with TAF um, is, uh, is acceptable and likely to be fine. Um, uh, and then in, um, um, I think I just showed you this, so uh, um, I'm repeating myself here, sorry. Um, I'll just. Oh, it's because I'm going in the wrong direction. Okay, so um, now what about children? A uh, study just published uh, two weeks ago in the New England Journal uh, looked at a four-month regimen of uh, treatment of tuberculosis in children. I've underlined the three Johns Hopkins authors from Johns Hopkins, India, and Pune, who um, uh, were part of this study. Um, and this was a study uh, in uh, um children under 16, but the median age was three and a half, who had non-severe TB. So they had uh, pulmonary TB, but they didn't have cavities or complex effusions. They didn't have miliary TB or, or meningeal TB. Uh, only 11% had HIV and only 14% had confirmed TB um, microbiologically, but that's because it's so difficult uh, to confirm TB. And they were treated with a four month regimen of standard drugs um, versus a six month regimen. And uh, overall, the four month regimen uh, did fine in terms of unsuccessful outcomes. You can see 3% in each arm um, and there's really no difference. So this is uh, an advance for children with TB, including uh, children with HIV. Um, there we go again. Uh, just a quick word about MDR-TB. Overall, treatment outcomes for MDR-TB are terrible. Only 50% of patients globally with MDR-TB who get treatment, most don't even get treatment, but those who do have poor outcomes, only half of them are successfully treated. This changed rather dramatically a couple of years ago with the NICS-TB study, which used a novel regimen of th three new uh, agents, uh, protominid, uh, nitroimidazole, bedaquilin, an ATP uh, 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 inhibitor, and linazolid, a repurposed drug, an uncontrolled six-month trial uh, in, in people with and without HIV, half of the patients had HIV, and it achieved a 90% success rate uh, for people with MDR and XDR-TB, and same, same uh, results for people with HIV um, uh, compared to the previous uh, experience that I showed you with um, very poor uh, success rates. Um, and safety uh, was tolerable, although there were a lot of adverse events, but they were manageable and uh, virtually all patients who didn't have um, uh, early 
uh, uh, treatment unrelated uh, problems were able to successfully complete therapy uh, with a 90% uh, treatment success rate. At Croy uh, recently, the TB Practical study was reported, a randomized trial of the regimen from NixTB, which is uh, the, the three drugs I mentioned, uh, with or without um, uh, um, uh, moxifloxacin or clofazamine. And again, treatment for six months. Um, and that study <clears throat> found um, that the bedacmalin, uh, 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 protomidid, linazolid with moxi uh, regimen had the, the, the greatest success, about a 90% uh, success rate. Um, but success was measured by um, um, whether treatment had to be altered or stopped. Uh, and what drove the difference was not microbiologic and clinical success, but toxicity of the control regimen and people uh, giving up on it because of uh, side effects. So now we have uh, a four month uh, uh, regimen for, uh, uh, I mean, a six month regimen for people with MDR TB, and it works equally well in people with HIV. So just a few words about preventive therapy. Um, we showed in a series of trials uh, uh, beginning 15 years ago that a uh, 12 dose, three month regimen of uh, weekly rifapentine and uh, isoniazid called 3HP was effective in um, preventing uh, tuberculosis in high risk individuals, people who are household contacts or um, people with HIV uh, infection. Um, we showed that it was um, non-inferior to nine months of isoniazid or 12 months of isoniazid. Uh, it was safer um, and it had better adherence and treatment completion. And from the largest study, uh, the one on the bottom at the uh, left, um, uh, what you see is that uh, time is what is important, that even though the rate of discontinuing treatment uh, is slightly higher with the 3-HP regimen, it's done sooner. And so the longer you're on a treatment regimen, the more opportunity you have to give it up. And this is um, often driven by patient preference as opposed to toxicity. So one of the questions for people with HIV, particularly in high burden settings is, well, is once enough? Uh, should we be repeating treatments for latent TB? Uh, uh, to prevent TB. So the WIP-TB study was published last uh, summer in the Annals. Um, and this was a study that took people with uh, HIV in um, three high burden countries in Africa uh, and randomized them to uh, a small group were randomized to six months of INH as a uh, control. And then uh, they were randomized to get the 3-HP regimen once or twice with a repeat uh, round uh, after a year. Um, so if you look at the completion rate for the, um, uh, for the treatment, uh, uh, for the 3-HP, the treatment rate was 90% versus 50% for the INH, again, because over time people uh, give up on it. And if we look at the efficacy for um, TB, um, uh, a second round of treatment uh, was uh, uh, unnecessary. It didn't add any benefit. If we look at um, mortality over here, there was actually a slightly higher um, mortality rate uh, in the people who had a repeated um, course of the 3-HP, but it was not um, significant. And um, it, there's no, ev no evidence that it was uh, treatment uh, related. So, Annual treatment or retreatment of TB infection for people who've already been treated in high burden settings is not beneficial. And so this is really useful for uh, national HIV and TB programs. Um, what about <clears throat> antiretroviral therapy? The DOLPHIN study, which uh, Kelly Dooley again uh, led, um, looked at people uh, getting the 3-HP regimen and um, being treated with uh, uh, dolutegravir once daily, not twice daily. And overall, there was a decline in drug exposure with this uh, drug interaction, but um, uh, a modest decline in the AUC. But um, uh, all of the patients uh, in the study maintain undetectable uh, viral loads uh, uh, 
while they were uh, receiving this uh, dual therapy. And so uh, once daily dolutegravir can be used for people um, receiving the 3-HP regimen, uh, we're in the midst now of the Dalton 2 study, which is looking at people who are starting the dolutegravir-based ART uh, when they get 3-HP, whereas the original Dalton were people who were already on dolutegravir. Uh, four months of rifampin is another option uh, that had two studies uh, that I won't go into. Very few HIV patients in these studies, but this is uh, also an option. And then most recently is the 1HP regimen, um, uh, um, uh, rifpentine and isoniazid is given daily for one month. And this was shown to be non-inferior to uh, nine months of uh, isoniazid, including in uh, individuals who had confirmed TB infection. Um, this was all people with HIV, uh, mostly in high burden countries. Uh, and uh, the one month regimen was uh, equally efficacious as uh, nine months of isoniazid. Um, <clears throat> during this study, we looked at efavirenz uh, co-administration and uh, efavirenz co-administration uh, was not affected by one month of, uh, of uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, rifapentine uh, and isoniazid. At Croy, um, uh, this regimen was looked at with dolutegravir, 1-HP and dolutegravir, and the dolutegravir was given twice daily for the one month of a treatment. And I'm going to move quickly in the interest of time that, and uh, what was shown was that by doubling the dose of dolutegravir with the 1-HP regimen, the exposures were actually increased, uh, but there were uh, no uh, individuals who had a concentration below the critical concentration for maintaining viral um, suppression. Uh, and this study team will now move on to look at um, uh, once daily dolutegravir given the results uh, seen here. Um, <clears throat> so um, just in terms of making the, these therapies available, we've been working with uh, a, a large group funded by Unitaid to scale up uh, the use of rifapentine-based prevention for TB in people with HIV and in uh, uh, child household contacts. Um, we've been able to reduce the cost of rifapentine from $72 to $15. Uh, and get uh, generic competition. This program has sponsored the dolphin studies and will be soon beginning a, a dolphin mom study looking at pregnant women and a dolphin kids study looking at children and co-administration of rifapentine-based treatments and uh, dolutegravir. Uh, and good news that uh, a, a fixed dose combination uh, isoniazid rifapentine uh, pill is now on the market as a result of our um, uh, <clears throat> advocacy with generic manufacturers. So anyway, uh, just to, to wrap up, um, there are now multiple options for TB preventive therapy in people with, with and without HIV. The WHO and the US Public Health Service are now emphasizing the shorter course rifapentine-based regimens of the 3-HP or, or 1-HP that we know can be safely co-administered with modern uh, current uh, antiretroviral therapies. So uh, I'll, I'll end there, but I want to end uh, with some very special uh, thanks um, to Carla Alwood. Um, and uh, Carla, uh, as many of you know, will be retiring uh, next week. Uh, what many of you may not know is that uh, 30 years ago, when the Baltimore City Health Department asked me if I would be willing to take over the TB clinic because they didn't have a doctor, um, I said, sure. And I asked for volunteers in the Moore Clinic and Carla jumped right up and said, I'm coming with you. And uh, shortly after we arrived, Carla did an analysis of uh, directly observed therapy for people with HIV-related TB and published this paper, which ended up changing CDC policy. Uh, uh, so just an incredible impact. But uh, Carla's had an incredible impact on all of us uh, for over 35 years. And I just want to especially uh, thank her for all she's done um, for all of us. So I'll end there, Eileen. Thanks. And I'm happy to take questions in the chat.
Thanks so much, um, Dick. That was a, a fantastic overview and also really a, a nice note for Carla. We'll have to take a little bit more time to talk about her in, in a future meeting. So in the interest of time, if you have uh, questions for Dick, please put them in the chat and then I'll introduce our next speaker, who's um, Dr. Ann Binder, who uh, again requires no introduction, is an, a world expert in the um, synergistic issues of HIV and malignancies, and who's going to give us an update on those issues today. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Ambinder. Thank you for the invitation. Um, it's my pleasure. I'm going to touch on aspects of lymphoma and Kaposi sarcoma and some related KSHV problems, but let me uh, present this table that's sort of a summary of AIDS-defining and non-AIDS-defining cancers in the uh, era of effective retroviral therapy, and uh, begin by saying, so non-Hodgkin's lymphomas used to be much more common than they are, but they're still about tenfold more common than in the general population. And Hodgkin lymphoma initially wasn't recognized as an HIV um, defining cancer, is not an HIV defining, uh, not an AIDS defining cancer, um, but is also substantially increased in our uh, HIV population. And um, I want to talk a bit about uh, diagnostic delay and missed opportunities for cure, but first persuade you that, in fact, uh, cure is possible in almost everyone if there's not horrendous delay um, in making a diagnosis. And uh, the AIDS Malignancy Consortium recently finished a trial of a regimen that, that was... Um, recently approved for people without HIV with Hodgkin lymphoma um, that involves a new drug, brentuximab, which is a, a monoclonal antibody with uh, chemotherapy attached, if you will, that targets CD30 on the surface of tumor cells. And I won't belabor the regimen except to say it's got this new very interesting drug. And this is now a frontline therapy for people without HIV uh, who have Hodgkin lymphoma. And this was a trial to see how it did in people with HIV. And, and the first thing we learned is that in the uh, initial uh, phase one run-in, there were some deaths due to people on boosted regimens, um, strong CYP3A4 um, inhibitors are dangerous in combination with brentuximab. And for everyone who's treating HIV patients who may be getting chemotherapy, um, it's really important to be touching base with the oncologist um, to make sure that any changes in antiretroviral regimens are not going to uh, pose issues. Um, we had a patient who died, not, not here, where the uh, regimen was changed in the midst of therapy and, and there wasn't awareness that it was changed and there was a bad drug interaction. So this is um, potentially a very serious problem and uh, for anybody who's going to chemotherapy, non-interacting regimens, um, integrase inhibitors and so on are, are much more attractive. These are the uh, curves um, for the outcomes at two years and, and uh, they look virtually the same. In A, it's all the patients on the study and in B, it's all the patients with advanced disease in the study it didn't make much difference. Virtually everyone um, goes into remission who gets this treatment and there are very few relapses. And these results are um, as good and arguably better 
than what's seen in the non-HIV population. So very effective treatment that's available. There was a very curious finding um, that is still unexplained and will motivate further studies. And that is that whereas chemotherapy in general drops CD4 counts, drops lymphocyte counts, drops CD8 counts, um, this particular regimen that included brentuximab saw a uh, approximate doubling of the CD4 count and a slightly lesser increase in the CD8 count during the course of therapy. And this is different than anything that's been seen with any other cytotoxic chemotherapy regimen. We don't have a good handle on it yet. There's some hand-waving that uh, CD30, that is the target of brentuximab, may be on um, regulatory T cells and that this may allow an expansion of uh, other T cells, but, but in fact, the, the answer isn't in. There was a small decrease in HIV viral load during the course of therapy, um, but uh, a, a curious but uh, interesting observation. So the conclusion of the study, um, again, the outcomes were as good or better than in the non-HIV population in terms of disease-free survival. Neutropenia and um, sensory neuropathy were worse. And so these are definitely things that need to be, uh, we need to be sensitive to during treatment. Um, every single person who made it through treatment um, had a negative PET scan at the end of therapy. So again, very impressive activity. We've already talked about drug interactions. We've already talked about the uh, increase in T cells um, and the uh, progression-free survival and overall survival, re really spectacularly good. Um, having said that, um, if we look at Hodgkin's in general in HIV patients, um, there are some differences to be aware of from, from people without HIV. People are more likely to have B symptoms. Um, I think most people think of Hodgkin's disease as being associated with lymphadenopathy, and it often is almost always is outside of HIV, but in HIV, there are patients who have marrow only presentations. Um, and in that group in particular, um, diagnosis may be delayed because of an extensive differential diagnosis. And when I'm showing you the very good results from the clinical trial, I should note that about a third or, or more of the patients that we see at Hopkins are so far advanced and so sick that they can't go on these clinical trials. They don't meet the entry criteria. And I'm gonna tell you about one such patient just to illustrate. This was a 33-year-old lady who uh, had uh, drug using partners and became HIV positive and was only intermittently compliant with her antiretroviral therapy. Um, she was seen in an area hospital where she was profoundly anemic. She got five units of red cells, but no one was clear on what her anemia was all about. Um, a whole variety of infections were considered, um, and she had fevers and night sweats. A mycobacterial infection was high on the last list. Um, ultimately, she was uh, admitted to Hopkins, 
no lymphadenopathy. Um, the uh, differential was uh, histo, CMV, EBV, a variety of other infections, disseminated MAI. EBV PCR was done and she had a quite high EBV copy number. I take pains to say copy number rather than viral load because I'm going to tell you that, that when we measure EBV in plasma, um, sometimes it's virion DNA, sometimes it's viral load, and sometimes it's tumor DNA. And in this case, it was almost certainly tumor DNA. Um, the white count was very low. The bilirubin was very high. That's why she couldn't be treated with standard therapy once a diagnosis was made. And it was made when a bone marrow biopsy was performed. And, and here's the bone marrow that, that shows this classic picture of uh, CD30 positive large Reed Sternberg cells and a stain for uh, EBV. And I might mention in passing that, that Hodgkin lymphoma in general in the United States is about 20% EBV positive, but in people with HIV, it's 90% EBV positive. So it's a very good marker for uh, HIV associated uh, Hodgkin's disease. And I think offers the one of the possibilities for facilitating earlier diagnosis. Um, and you'll all be familiar with the shortcomings of that approach. That is, when you get EBV on a patient, sometimes it's infectious mono. This is a, a report that we did from people who um, had blood sent to the central micro lab at Hopkins for EBV levels. And when, when we looked back at uh, three years of data, we found that there was a wide range of people that, that had EBV where it turned out it was associated with mono and a similar wide range for post-transplant lymphoma and nasopharyngeal carcinoma, EBV related malignancies and EBV associated Hodgkin's and a large group of people who had no EBV associated disease at all. And so one of the problems with EBV as a tumor marker is that it is nonspecific and sick people often will have lots of EBV in their blood. Um, so, so while it can be indicative of the presence of tumor, there's, there's a lot of uh, background. And actually in COVID, we're seeing even more background and it's quite common for people with COVID to reactivate EBV in their blood. We've um, been looking for ways to tell what is tumor DNA versus virion DNA. And these are patients with um, EBV negative Hodgkin lymphoma and EBV positive Hodgkin lymphoma who have equal happy number of EBV in their plasma. But if we look at whether that EBV is methylated, we're only seeing the methylated EBV in the patients with tumor. And we think that methylated EBV is likely to be a very good marker for the presence of tumor as opposed to just viral reactivation that can accompany HIV and, and other serious illness. Um, there's another DNA marker in the blood, which is clonal immunoglobulin DNA. You may be aware that Hodgkin for many years was um, not known to be a B cell malignancy because it doesn't express immunoglobulins, but in fact, we know it's a B lineage malignancy. The um, immunoglobulin genes are rearranged just as they are in all B cells. And some of those leak into the blood, the, the clonally arranged DNA. And so we have a, a study going on where we're trying to use the presence of viral DNA in its methylated form and clonal immunoglobulin DNA to see if we can't facilitate the uh, 
diagnosis of Hodgkin lymphoma and uh, the studies actually going on in South Africa. And, and uh, I think I was deliberately following uh, Dick's presentation about TB because TB is the big problem in South Africa. In fact, um, because there's so much TB and it's the major cause of death for people with HIV, if you look at people who end up with the diagnosis of Hodgkin lymphoma, they've typically been treated for TB for several months and are often on death's door before they're diagnosed. Uh, it's only people who are failing sort of empiric therapy for TB that are getting the appropriate diagnostic procedures. And so we think that uh, if we can validate the uh, utility of finding clonal immunoglobulin and EBV DNA from a blood test that we may be able to uh, pull people out from their empiric therapy and uh, pursue more aggressive diagnostics for Hodgkin lymphoma, as it is a, a third or larger fraction of Hodgkin lymphoma patients with HIV in South Africa just don't get treated at all because by the time they're diagnosed, they're too sick to get any kind of chemotherapy. The patient we talked about um, was uh, luckier. Um, although she was quite sick, we uh, used this uh, at the time very new drug, brentuximab, as a single agent, dose reduced because of her liver dysfunction, um, treated her. She got developed pancreatitis, which is a complication of that therapy, cardiomyopathy, which we actually don't understand, um, had other other issues, um, went on to a checkpoint inhibitor and didn't respond, went on to another aggressive chemotherapy regimen, did respond, got a non-myeloblative transplant, uh, allo allogeneic transplant with an HIV resistant donor. And I tell this story just to uh, give me the opportunity to share with you that with our present transplant regimens, we can find HIV resistant donors, CCR5, Delta 32 homozygotes for about 80% of the patients we see, including the majority of uh, black and Latino patients. So um, we think it is likely that uh, um, patients who for other reasons need an allogeneic transplant can be cured of their HIV. We have um, a couple of people who are more than a year and a half out um, from transplant and uh, the results are quite encouraging. With that, let me briefly move on to Kaposi sarcoma. As you see from the uh, table, the incidence of Kaposi sarcoma in uh, HIV is about 500 fold more than in the general population. That's a dramatic improvement. It used to be 30,000 times more. Um, so it's, it's full and precipitously, but is still um, far more common in the HIV population than in the general population. And uh, just to remind you what it can look like, it can be flat, it can be papules. I, I've seen cases that uh, give me alarm and I just wanted to uh, share with you my alarm at, at some problems. Um, first, maybe because the name sarcoma and because it's increasingly rare, there are people who are getting a biopsy, making a diagnosis and thinking that like some other sarcomas, a surgical intervention is needed. And I've seen people with um, amputations of toes and parts of feet and other very aggressive surgical approaches and, and 
this is absolutely wrong. Um, there is no evidence that resection is associated with cure. Um, improvement in immune function is associated with a functional cure. There are, uh, there's a movement to change the name from Kaposi sarcoma to disease in order to uh, make this kind of uh, misunderstanding of the pathogenesis uh, more clear so people pursue uh, less aggressive surgical approaches. Um, surgery really only has a role in making a diagnosis. That is, you never need more than a punch biopsy. Um, the new, recent news in terms of treatment is that uh, in addition to some longstanding IV approaches, um, there's an oral therapy with pomalidomide that's now available. This is uh, an imid related to thalidomide. Um, it's it's uh, a bit of a it's it's there, there are lots of regulatory hurdles in prescribing it because of the relationship with thalidomide, but it is fairly effective and uh, is the first oral option for the treatment of Kaposi sarcoma. And it's a pretty well tolerated drug. Um, another thing to mention is that steroids are really a disaster for people with KS. And there's also a movement to have everyone with KS have steroids listed in their drug allergies. About a quarter of the patients that I see with um, newly diagnosed are people who've recently been treated with steroid creams, steroid inhalers for asthma, orthopedic injections, or systemic steroids for something else. And, uh, and um, I think when, when people see a rash and don't know what it is, there's a tremendous inclination to uh, give people topical or systemic steroids. And, and that's just a disaster in chaos. And these patients should stay away from steroids if at all possible. Um, I should also mention very briefly that, that when antiretroviral therapy is initiated, um, patients will often blossom with their first KS or KS that they have gets a bit worse. This usually uh, turns the corner and starts getting better after about three months. Um, if the uh, disease that they have is not cosmetically disastrous, it's not on the face, the lesions aren't rapidly increasing, it's fine just to watch. But if uh, it is uh, on the face or new lesions are rapidly appearing, this can be reversed with pretty gentle chemotherapy. And lastly, let me mention that there's this fairly recently described syndrome of Kaposi sarcoma inflammatory cytokine syndrome. It's very similar to Castleman disease, also associated with KSHV, HHV8. Um, the two are distinguished by biopsy. If there's lymphadenopathy, the picture is showing the uh, sort of onion skin of uh, KSHV infected cells that are producing IL-6 and lead to the high fevers, night sweats, cachexia, weight loss, and so on that accompanies both of these uh, syndromes. Um, treatments are still very much in evolution, but people who, who are suspected of having this should be referred either to us or to the NIH or some other major medical center. There are effective interventions. We have often saved people who were unbelievably sick and other people um, have died very quickly. And I will stop there and take questions. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Inbinder. That was really an amazing amount of um, 
ground to cover. So I'll just ask you briefly in, in a minute, and if anyone has other questions, please put them in the chat. But in this idea of Iris around the time of, of Kaposi's, there's a, a case recently of a, a woman who started treatment and then represented and was receiving chemotherapy for her Kaposi's and also ART for her HIV, represented with pulmonary symptoms. And then she ultimately evolved into a, a pericardial effusion. And it's very hard when you take our steroid tools away in terms of how to manage iris type phenomena for KS. And I was, in her particular case, she ended up going to the NIH and had a sort of overlap syndrome. Uh, you may recall this case, but um, just wondering if you had any particular thoughts about how to manage that type of, of so, so absolutely. I think the most important thing is not to use steroids. And, and there are lots of other interventions that, that I listed and, and they work and steroids are a disaster. And so um, I think sort of reflexes are often wrong for these uh, kicks like syndromes right. and, uh, and, uh, Please feel free to contact me for any such discussions or cases. And um, the group at the NIH um, has really dedicated themselves to sorting this syndrome out. And uh, I've been a funnel to get them uh, a, a bunch of patients from yes. Hopkins. And uh, we'll continue to do that. And, and the results are often good. Yes. Um, and just one other question, I think, from Chris Hoffman that's in the chat about your approach to patients with CD4 counts in the normal range and viral suppression, but who develop cutaneous KS. So, so I, I think it's the, the same. That is, um, and, and I should say, I have a whole group, um, probably eight or 10 now, um, MSM, who don't have HIV, who have gotten KS. Um, we don't fully understand the genesis of that, but um, there are some people who really don't need treatment. They got one or two spots. One was biopsy that came back positive. It's on the leg and it's not cosmetically objectionable. And I think you can watch them. Um, but, but some people get uh, lesions that... Um, are more numerous and or individual lesions become quite large. They respond well to chemotherapy and uh, they're eligible for our new trial with pomalidomide that should be open here within a couple more weeks or so. Um, love, love to see them. Um, Great. And, and often, yeah, and often do well if we can keep them away from steroids. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions from the group? Um, and if not, I'll just thank you so much for your time and for the expertise that you give to our patients as well as to us as providers. We're, we're so thankful. And um, we will keep that in mind. And, and should cases come up of, of that type of chaos, we'll be sure to refer them to you for consideration for your, um, for your upcoming trial. So, I think that's a great thing to find out about. Great. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everybody. Have a good weekend.